So welcome to our final session for this two-day conference. Uh, I do have to say uh, thanks at the beginning. I will thank Carol McNamara at the end, but our Associate Director for Public Programs, Dr. Carol McNamara, who coordinates the S steering committee for the Civic Discourse Project and, and for this annual, that includes this annual conference. What a marvelous range of conversations we've had across this day and a half, uh, different viewpoints. Uh, and so to put a little pressure on, on Peter and Bill here, we hope to finish on a, on a strong note to have a good conversation here about civic education um, at the end. So we chose the theme here, civic education and renewal, restoring American civic legitimacy as a way to pull together for an educational institution uh, questions about citizenship and leadership in America. Uh, an educational institution that's a public university thinking out to the country, to America, and uh, questions of citizenship education. Uh, the, the context here in the Phoenix area in Arizona is uh, shaped by Justice O'Connor's legacy um, as much in her retirement as when she was on the United States Supreme Court. When she did step down from the U.S. Supreme Court, she became deeply interested in the question of civic education, citizenship education. And one of the phrases that she used was that America's quiet crisis was a decline in concern for, support for, quality of civic education, citizenship education in schools, in, in public and private schools, but also beyond. That was more than a decade ago, and some of us in the Phoenix area who, who work with the O'Connor Institute, who know about iCivics in, in Massachusetts that Justice O'Connor helped found, uh, we, we think of it as not so quiet a crisis uh, anymore. The consequences of decline for support for and resources for civic education, citizenship education. Uh, so the, the thesis of this, which could be rebutted, is that some of the polarization, dysfunctional polarization and anger, uh, some of the apathy of citizens who don't engage, participate, vote, um, some of the general decline in legitimacy of or regard for American institutions, but also professions, some of that is rooted in failures of or inadequate citizenship education, civic education. So that's why we use the words renewal and, and restoring in the title of the panel. <clears throat> and, and another context for us here at ASU and particularly our school is that we were invited to join a national study funded by the U.S. Department of Education and the National Endowment for Humanities. And actually Peter Levine was one of the people who invited our school at ASU to join that effort. So institutes based at Harvard University, at Tufts University where Peter is, uh, and the iCivics in Massachusetts reached out to us to join uh, a proposal for a grant to the NEH and the Department of Education funded by those federal institutions to study K-12 civic education, primarily in public schools, uh, on the premise that it, the, the situation on the one hand needed to be a mapped or assessed, and on the other hand, it probably was not in as good a shape as it should be, citizenship ed education. So we're in the middle of that study, and ASU actually will be hosting one of the national workshop convenings of that study at, at the end of next month. So uh, with that, um, w what we have for you in the final session here is um, an opportunity for our two guests, who I will introduce, uh, each to make some opening remarks on the theme of the panel. Then in the second part of our uh, final session, I will pose some questions to them uh, and we'll have a bit of a discussion among the three of us. And in the third part, as we have for all of our other sessions, we'll have time for uh, open questions and, uh, and answers, questions from the floor. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce uh, first Peter Levine and then uh, Bill McClay. Peter Levine, uh, directly next to me, is the academic dean and the Lincoln Finley Professor of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Tufts University in the Jonathan Tisch College of Civic Life at Tufts. 
He was the founding deputy director and then the second director of the Tisch College's CIRCLE Center. The acronym stands for the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement. Uh, his first book, I'll just give a, just a few writings from each of our guests. First book was Nietzsche and the Modern Crisis of the Humanities. Uh, and his most recent book is We Are the Ones We Have Been Waiting For, The Promise of Civic Renewal in America. He's also the author of several other scholarly books on philosophy and politics and a novel. And then uh, on the far side of the stage with us is Wilfred McClay, goes by the name Bill McClay. He is the G.T. and Libby Blankenship Chair in the History of Liberty at the University of Oklahoma, also a visiting professor this year at Pepperdine University in their School of Public Affairs. Uh, he is the director at the University of Oklahoma of the Center for the History of Liberty. Uh, an early book in his scholarly repertoire is The Masterless, Self and Society in Modern America. His most recent book is Land of Hope, an invitation to the great American story. And that is designed as a text or textbook for US history and civics courses in high school or in universities or colleges. And Bill is also a former member of the National Humanities Council, which is the advisory board to the National Endowment for the Humanities. Please join me in welcoming Peter Levine and Bill McClay. And so we, we didn't toss a coin, we just decided to go by alphabetical order. And so Peter Levine will make uh, opening remarks. Thank you, Paul. So uh, what Paul didn't mention was we went to grad school together early, early in the history of the American Republic, um, <laughs> a long, long time ago. And, uh, and so it's been a great pleasure to re-encounter re Paul through their work, really, uh, after all these years. Uh, and thank you all, thanks for the support of the college, but also thanks to all for being here on a, on a Saturday afternoon. It's quite an amazing uh, retention of the, of the audience. Um, I always think that if, you're, if your audience is bigger than the panel, it's a success, and you're much more numerous. So I just wanted to, uh, I'll, I'll give you in some ways my, my quick stump speech, which uh, I've, I've said before, to hope that some people haven't heard it before from me. But um, I like to say uh, that a citizen uh, is defined, and this is across time and place in all regimes, is defined by, as someone who seriously asks one simple four-word question. So this is the civic question, and it's the very definition of a citizen that you ask it. And the question is, what should we do? And I just want to parse it for you for, for a couple of minutes. The, the question ends with do, um, partly because, we, because to be civic is to take moral responsibility for what, for what we do. Now, to not do something is a choice, and sometimes it's the wisest choice, but you're still, that still has consequences, and you're responsible for it. So one reason to end with do is because we should be taking responsibility for doing. But another reason is because I think it's a form of intellectual discipline to ask, what should we do? Not what should somebody else do? What should happen? What should we do? What, or why are things happening? But what should we do? It, it's, a, it's a challenging question, and it's, it's, it enriches us to ask it. Uh, the question is, what should we do? Because it's a fundamentally ethical question, a normative question if you want to use the more fancy term. Um, so it's not what do we want to do or what do we feel like doing or what will happen, it's what should we do. And that's a tough question because we disagree about the should and you can't just easily look it up, but if you're a serious citizen, you ask the question. The question is what should we do, and this is the real keyword. Now it's not the only question because it's also important to ask what should I do, that's the basic ethical question. But you should ask what should we do for at least two reasons. One, because I, by myself, can't do much, I'm not very powerful. And secondly, because I, by myself, am not very smart. In fact, I'm actually pretty stupid. So it's only when I ask what should we do with some other people who have different opinions and perspectives that I can possibly get smart. The, the we always, or not always, but has a, uh, an inevitable tendency to slip away, the we, the real we. And, and actually, I have a hobby of listening for the use of the we in this kind of forum, and I hear it all the time, so we should uh, open our borders or close our borders. So that's not a real we. I mean, we are sitting here in this room together. We can't open or close the borders of the United States. If we took a vote now on open them or close them, uh, that vote would be empty. We could do things. For example, we could advocate for policies by the United States government, but that's a, 
that's a serious matter. Then we'd actually have to decide how to do it. Are we going to organize who's going to take the message? Do we actually have an agreement here? Probably not. If we don't, do we, how do we handle that? So the we tends to slip off to what should be done or what should someone else do, particularly what should the government do. Um, holding on to the we is the civic virtue. And, and the question is, what should we do? And I know I'm stretching it a little here, but it is an empirical question, a question of you have to, in order to understand what should we do, you have to grapple with the facts, information, choices, costs, benefits, the, the, yeah, the science of it. So you asked uh, Paul, uh, at least in, when emailing us about what to talk about, what's the role of, of education in all this? And I would say, in order to ask the question, what should we do well, you have to learn a lot. It's a lifelong process. Um, not sure you have to learn in schools. So I'll come back to that in a minute, but you do have to learn a lot. In fact, you have to learn so much that it could be a long uh, laundry list. I would like to suggest you have three big topics you got to get good at, and you have to learn these because they don't come naturally. One is how to actually organize functional groups that coordinate enough that they get things done. Uh, if, you, if you like this kind of jargon, you have to learn to overcome the problem of collective action, but if you don't know that or like that jargon, you just have to make a group work. That's one category. Second ca category, since we'll disagree, you have to learn how to uh, deliberate matters of, of dis disagreement with other people. So you those are, that's a question of both skills and also to some extent of actual knowledge. So you need to understand where people are coming from. So you need to have a grasp of religious and political tradition and uh, philosophical traditions. And then finally, you have to know what to do when the we isn't right. When you're um, excluded or when other people are excluded who should be in the we or when you want out. So I think of I think of two iconic figures, you know, Gandhi and King. Uh, Gandhi, born in uh, the British Empire, which by the time, by the end of his career, he wants out of, and King, born in the United States, but not with full membership in that polity, wanting in. Um, and one method of dealing with those problems is, is revolution or, or something violent. Um, it actually should be on the table. I mean, this country was founded with a revolution. I'm not saying it's always wrong. I'm kind of pessimistic about revolution's working very well. So I think an important part of the curriculum is um, the, the tradition of nonviolent um, civil disobedience and social movement activism. Those are the three categories. I want to say, um, when you're talking about what um, makes functional, what makes groups function, we're talking at all scales where there's a real we. So one scale that is important is the scale of the nation state. And if you want it to be a, a, a forum for the question, what should we do, then it has to be a republic. It has to be a race public. It has to be our public. And so one set of questions will be about the proper organization of a republic in the context in which you live. So that's when you do get into questions like how many branches of government and what are their jobs and how many levels of government. And that is part of what I'm beginning to present to you as a curriculum. But notice that it fits in a certain place. So it's not the primary question. So actually, that brings me to two well, maybe I'll give myself the space since I have five minutes for three observations. First of all, um, this, this learning could be experiential. And I think, uh, here's another mention of de Tocqueville. We have to mention him at least another time. So his view would be Americans learned this experientially. We self-govern at this micro level in, in voluntary associations in towns, and we learn from that the skills that we need for national government. So I actually believe in that. I believe in it very strongly. But I think there's a role for schools anyway. So, and I think when he came to America, we didn't really learn the curriculum in, that I just presented in schools. We had schools, we didn't learn that curriculum. I think schools do play a role for two reasons. One is because of the very poor condition of our um, civic life. So in fact, we're not self-governing in all these array of um, voluntary associations. We're not learning it that way. A second reason though is that we actually can learn these things in school. So, and in fact, we're better at learning these things in school. So we know more about collective action problems than we did when de Tocqueville wrote about them, although he wrote very well about them. De Tocqueville should be on the curriculum, but we have some more recent work. So I think we can teach this. That's, that's um, the first point. Second point is just, uh, maybe I already made it implicitly, but I'll say it explicitly. This is like a regular civics curriculum, except it's importantly exactly backwards in the opposite order, and that matters. So the usual question would be, what are the three branches of government? Or, to be a little less pedantic, why does our government organize the way it is? And what is the nation state to which you children belong? And I say that's a good question in its place. You get to that. You really need to get to that. But it's not a good starting question for two reasons. One is because um, it's not self-evident why you should be care about those questions. And I think actually 
the, my diagnosis for why adult Americans don't do well on tests about those questions is not that they didn't study it, because actually they did. It's because they forgot it, because they didn't understand why it was interesting. But the second more, more, more uh, sort of pragmatic but really important reason is because curricula are actually incredibly uh, demanding on teachers. They're asked to teach a tremendous amount. And all of what I just mentioned is often in a state standard, for example. But since it begins with three branches of government, it, it ends sometime somewhere along with how we should organize voluntary associations in civil society, they never get to that. And since I'd actually priori make the opposite priority, I would, I would, uh, I'm worried about that. So the last point is why, and I, m I meant to mention this right up front, but why should you ask this question, uh, what should we do? So I'll end with this. I mean, I think two categories of reasons. One is that the world's better off if lots of people are asking that question in lots of venues, lots of scales, um, asking it seriously, doing a good job asking it. That the world will be better run and managed and we will solve our problems. That is not an argument, that's just a statement. I'd have to, oh, I'd owe a lot of argument. And I'm not sure it's 100, I'm not sure it's always true. I just think it's a pretty strong rule of thumb. But the other reason is, is the reason that uh, wonderful comments about Aristotle brought out yesterday, and which I agree with anyway, which is that asking that question is part of a good life. Um, it's a noble, dignified question. Um, it's a question that also enriches the inner life because in asking what should we do with the two of you on this panel, I'm forced to confront what you think we should do, and uh, in doing that, I get a more complex, richer inner life. I'm not sure it's the only kind of life that's good, and that was brought up in the panel on, uh, in discussion in Aristotle yesterday. Um, you, I, I think I'm open to the idea that there might be some other good lives which are really don't have much space for what should we do. A life, for example, of relentlessly pursuing truths about nature might be another good life, another dignified life. I can understand that, but I think this is, is a good life, and a good life that's open to everybody. And that's the other reason we should study it. Oh, I'm there. Bill. Uh, very, that's very interesting uh, and uh, nice, nice stuff to build on. I, I, don't, I don't actually think we disagree about much. We'll have to work on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> they keep the audience from going to That's space. my job. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah. But um, you know, I, I uh, understood us to be talking about the issue of citizenship and democracy uh, and the education of citizens. So. Uh, there was something that came up in Chris Caldwell's presentation about a scholar named Peter Spiro who uh, had, uh, I, I wasn't aware of this work, but he's, he, he's done some work relating to citizenship in which he makes the argument, and again, I'm paraphrasing what others have said, but that, that citizenship, uh, as it becomes more widely extended, um, as, its, uh, uh, as its sway is, is greater as the barrier stand, <coughs> excuse me, the barriers to entry become lower and lower, it becomes less and less important, less and less valuable. And uh, Chris Caldwell uh, raised an objection to that. Uh, uh, and actually, the sort of end, end uh, of that logic is that global citizenship is completely worthless <laughs> because it's, a, it's the ultimate extension of citizenship to everything and, and anything. And therefore, uh, and I think there's actually something to be said for that proposition, but just to be a little outrageous. But, uh, but this is, of course, fundamental economic reasoning. The, the more of a superfluity you have of something, the less value it has. Uh, but, I, but Caldwell uh, made the point that when in fact the citizenship does have a value in the modern welfare state, then, and uh, I think uh, he cashed it out as an American citizenship having a, a value of a million dollars in terms of uh, anticipated uh, uh, entitlement benefits and such that would accrue over the course of a lifetime. Uh, and you know, that's an interesting point. Uh, it, if, if true, then that conception of citizenship represents a decisive shift from what we have always, uh, in our national history, understood citizenship to be, or generally, and certainly at the time of the founding, understood it to be, and that is in, in Republican terms, uh, that citizenship is, uh, is, is uh, something that, uh, that relates to our membership and our active membership in a society that is self-governing. Uh, all of those things uh, brought in, that, and that, and that, that that we is a self-governing we that Peter was talking about. It, it, it is so to be Republican in the small r sense of the term is to is to uh, is to have that characteristic. Um, um, so th th this is a change of definition from uh, that earlier def definition 
to a kind of cash value understanding of, of citizenship, almost a kind of consumerist view that, that, that citizenship is worth so much. It cashes out to, to this much in, in green stamps or, or whatever unit of value you want to use. Um, I think this might be an example of Glenn Lowry's wonderful uh, formulation. And incidentally, I, it's a privilege to be part of, a, uh, of an enterprise with Glenn Lowry, Lowry included. He's one of the freest men I've ever met in terms of his intellectual freedom. Uh, that uh, putting relations before transactions, uh, uh, this new consumerist understanding of, of, of citizenship. And clearly this relates, uh, the, the, the Caldwell modification, if we may call it that, is uh, relates to, not that you're in favor of it, but <laughs> it relates to the rise of the administrative state. The rise of the administrative state uh, as opposed to republican democracy, the, opposed to the principle of self-rule, uh, which is of course a very big issue uh, in, in, within, between the two political parties, but within them as well. Uh, at, at this moment. And, and by the way, I would add uh, the, the uh, uh, Chica, is that her name? The, the, the presentation about uh, uh, populism and so on. I think one thing, it's a powerful presentation, but one thing that she left out, I, oh, you're here, yes. One thing I think you left out is the, the, the fact, what people are rebelling against, what this, this assertion of nationalism, and let's take the example of Brexit, uh, Brexit was an assertion by a larger majority than you allow of uh, people's right to rule themselves, to not be ruled by Brussels in every uh, facet of their lives and unconstitutionally, I might add. But uh, so that, that principle of, of, of self-rule is kind of stirring against the administrative state of the European Union. So there's, there's a whole lot of this going on all over the world. Uh, I take it as a given that the Republican citizen is made and not born. Uh, it, it, so a process of education is absolutely necessary. We don't just pop out. Uh, I, I would say all enduring human relationships require learning, <laughs> even being in a family, even being part of a tribe. Uh, but certainly there's a huge gap and a crucial gap between tribalism of any kind and Republican citizenship, that sort of civil or civic identity, which I think is part of what we've been talking about and, and moving towards. So how do you do this? How do you make, uh, well, if I may put it this way, make patriots? I'm echoing a, a famous book by Walter Burns on the subject of, of teaching patriotism, teaching uh, uh, national identity. Um, well, I think there are many things that uh, have to be taught, and, and not all of them in schools. Maybe schools are, I completely agree about that. Uh, but skepticism, skepticism of government, a, a critical disposition, these are important things for Republican citizens to have. Uh, a belief that natural rights or something like natural rights uh, exists as a source of authority for um, their rights beyond the whims of government that in some way are their individual rights, uh, human rights, if you like, are grounded in something beyond uh, the, the edicts of, of a particular government or particular person in power. Uh, uh, free speech uh, uh, and an, an, an activist orientation. You know, to be a part of a Republican government is to be, the, participate in the Vita Activa, uh, not con con contemplative, uh, I can't even say it, contemplative, uh, vita activa. So, uh, uh, but uh, I think there are other things, that, and we may disagree about some of this, but I think that in the end, civic education can't succeed without love, uh, without affection for the, the, that body of which one is a part, that some kind of enduring, even gratitude, which extends into the past, for those who have helped to bring, even if you think that where we're stuck with is a terrible mess in which terrible, sinful, erroneous uh, errors uh, be, you know, be, besiege us, uh, still a kind of, of, of deep gratitude for the fact of one's being in, within an order uh, rather than simple anarchy, chaos. And uh, I think also civic education has to include a sense of stewardship 
that is that uh, the elements of the regime are worth, worthy. They may be uh, abused in certain ways, but like you, I don't have much uh, faith in revolutions uh, uh, that they can be made more perfect, to use the language of the preamble of the Constitution. Uh, so that we are, the, the current generation is not just sort of set loose in the world to uh, reinvent things as they please, but that we're, we're stewards of something we have inherited. Uh, not in a sort of mystic sense of, of obligation to the past in every way. One of my favorite sayings about this is, comes from uh, Goethe, from Faust, uh, uh, and it goes like this, what you have as heritage, now make your task for thereby you will make it your own. So you, the inheritance becomes the task. You're given the task by what you inherit, including the, the mess and slop of it, but it's your task. And in that way, it's that wonderfully Lockean notion of, uh, of, uh, of mingling your labor with it to make it your property. Uh, it, thus you make it your own. Uh, so, uh, and I think this involves, to get to the, cut to the chase here finally, is, is history. I do think the study of history, which generally takes place in schools, <laughs> um, has to be a part of, of any good civic education because it has to point back to the, the things for which we have gratitude, for the things of which we are called to be stewards, uh, and the, the things that we remember, the simple, uh, uh, fact of being a community of memory, not all of which memories are good, <laughs> but to be a community of memory, to share uh, uh, memories of the past together as part of a narrative of our, our collective endeavor. The, the, this is part of what a civic education is or should be. And uh, uh, Gail, uh, who also is a privilege to be with Gail, uh, cited Lincoln, uh, who uh, you know, it's almost as important as Tocqueville in American history. Uh, and, 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 you know, the first inaugural, you know, ends with that wonderful inv invocation of the mystic chords of memory, which, uh, you know, stretched every hearthstone in the land. It, it's a very intimate image in some ways. Uh, uh, but he's saying that he's, he's pleading with the South, you know, baby, please don't go, you know. <laughs> uh, and and he's, he's pleading with them saying, you know, what about all the, what about all the good times we had, you know. <laughs> and, and, and you never heard the Gettysburg, uh, the, uh, the first inaugural interpreted this way before. Uh, you probably never will again. Uh, uh, but he's appealing to memory as a source of, uh, unsuccessfully, as it turns out, but as a source of cohesion, a word we've heard a lot today, a source of cohesion for the nation. So, um, so how, do you, how to instill love? I've got five minutes to do this. How to instill love? That is a, a, a very difficult task. I mean, every one of us who teaches this kind of stuff, uh, we want to avoid feeling that we're pounding uh, things into our students the way that we're, you know, that forcing them to say the Pledge of Allegiance seems often counterproductive, you know, and, and just instills resentment, rebellion, or just uh, the kind of boredom with a formulaic task that, that, that doesn't have any meaning. So I, I'm not in favor of, you know, <laughs> imposing as many sort of uh, loyalty oaths and, and tests of allegiance as possible. Uh, I think they need learning and, and they need things in the classroom, but they need to have uh, it be balanced by a sense that we're not only dealing with abstractions. Uh, there's actually a wonderful quote from William J James that I uh, have on this. Uh, James says in his, his book, um, uh, Talks to Teachers, really terrific, a little bit much neglected. It says, material things, things that move, living things, human actions and accounts of human actions, that's history, <laughs> will win the attention better than anything that is more abstract. I, I have a friend who thinks that all the problems of America and civic education will be solved if we just go around and teach the principles of the Declaration of Independence without any attention to the context in which they arose, the, the possible limitations of that context and, and so on. Uh, uh, I, that just won't cut it. I think the, the, the whole story is what we need. The whole story of how these things emerge, 
out of a long history of the development of freedom. So uh, 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 I think patriotism is not only a matter of schooling. And let, let me just say this, and I'll stop, uh, that to, to agree with Peter. I think uh, we met at dinner last night. We were, were talking for a while about juries. I think jury duty is one of the greatest teachers of what it means to have, I'll call it, a civic identity. Uh, and that, that is, a, you know, citizenship is about developing a sense of what, what do I as a citizen, irrespective of what, that, that's the we, what do I as a citizen, one of the collectivity of us that are citizens, what is my judgment about a subject? What is my judgment about a matter of law, uh, about the fair administration of, of, of law? It's the development of that kind of consciousness that I think is really the core of Republican education, of repu educating young people for Republican citizenship. So I think, <laughs> I think jury duty, ob obviously you can't put a bunch of teenagers or, or uh, early college students on juries, but uh, I think uh, the service, I've done it, it's an amazing experience, and many of you have, I know. So um, Tocqueville somewhere says, oh, there I said it, Tocqueville. Uh, <laughs> That, um, that democracy is a school of the soul. Um, and uh, it's others, uh, Christopher Lash writes beautifully about this. Uh, and and that, that's part of what, it, it, the jury is an example of that, that, that the, it's going through the experience of making that disinterested judgment, uh, thank you Elizabeth Corey, wherever you are, uh, <laughs> that disinterested judgment uh, in colleagueship with 11 other people, that making that disinterested judgment, that's, that's the core of developing the, the, the soul of a citizen. So we do need to find ways. <clears throat> now what we might disagree about is, I, I, I know, and the whole subject of public service came up yesterday as a, as a, a sort of term for, a sort of substitute for incarceration. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think that's a terrible, is prison of the, of, the, of the idea, but I think we need to be careful that, that public service as a requirement for college students not become a, form, a way of committing them to political causes in which the desiderata are already in place about what is good, what is right, or what is meaningful. So um, I'll stop there. Thank you, both of you. So uh, I, I do want to pick up on that last point. I mean, uh, Peter was the co-founder and then director of an institute at Tufts University that includes that word engagement, right? Civic learning and engagement. And Peter did say in his opening remarks that um, a, a certain kind of book learning shouldn't be the primary or maybe focal uh, question. Uh, Bill, you've just written a text that is a narrative history. Um, so what disagreement do you have? How, how, how can we get guidance from both of you as citizens and educators or civic leaders interested in addressing the deficit of, of uh, attachment to citizenship understood as active uh, citizenship what steps should we take? Uh, so I'll put a question. Oh, go. Well, I was going to say, that, and actually, this is to amplify something you said just in passing, almost. But um, I think you know one of the things that Tocqueville does emphasize is uh, how the American system, and he doesn't really use the term federalism very much, but that's really what he's talking about, has a way of subdividing activities so that citizens in uh, a small area who have to decide, you know. A, uh, a, a, a right away or some, some issue relating to real estate uh, in, in their county or township context. By being given the, the ability to make those decisions for themselves, even though they're very small things, very local, very provincial uh, things, but by be being given that local freedom, they, they are more attached to the nation through that. And, uh, and they gain the habit of self-rule, which can be applied in, in larger contexts. So I, I think one uh, 
consequence I would see is that I think uh, the more that we can invigorate our federal arrangements and, and let people make, you know, this can't be like being student council president, you know, let people make consequential decisions on a local level about them, themselves and about their lives. I'm determined to get the two of you to disagree. So, but you, Bill, you said just a minute ago, I don't know that I would want uh, teenagers or college students to be serving on juries. Isn't the, isn't the premise you have a certain <coughs> civic knowledge or civic yeah. literacy to and include maturity. historical? But they, they do, I mean, and maturity. They have, like, most college students have a oh, constitutional yeah. right to yeah. be on juries, and yes. high school students do a lot of uh, restorative justice yeah. and things like that, which involve making quite consequential decisions and somewhat outside the judicial system. So I would think that would you'd be Yeah, fine no, with I'm, that. I'm 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 yeah. for those kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. No, I think I, not 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 all, you know, I'd want to see the specifics. To make it so it's probably not interesting necessarily to look for differences. I mean, it, there's no reason we should have differences. Um, but one issue that's floating there and we haven't quite sharpened is the role of particularly the nation. Because Bill said we need we need love. So I'm 100% for that. But you didn't quite say explicitly love for what, and I think the answer was love for country. Um, maybe it wasn't, but but yeah. that, that that's an issue because for me, actually, love for country is one thing. But my, in my worldview, I mean, it is not just one thing; it's one virtue. But in my worldview, it's very polycentric. So we're in multiple yeah. associations at all scales, um, and the the federal scale is just one of them. Um, the, 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 the voluntary associational scale is really important. The federal has dignity. I mean, we need to pay attention to it, partly because um, it is a great story and we belong to it, partly because it's very powerful and the federal government is very powerful to the, externally to the world, so we better take some responsibility for this thing that can kill anybody anywhere in the world that it wants to kill. Um, but it's also not by any means comprehend. It's not synonymous with civic education, it, for one thing, because it is enormously big, and the, the, the degree of the we there. So, so we tend to slip into saying, what should we do about uh, Iraq? And we don't mean we, right? So, I'm, so I would be very polycentric, and I would be, and given the, the reason that I, I could put this a little polemically, or we could just keep agreeing. The reason I <laughs> want to put a little polemically is because actually kids are taught both American history and civics. They get spent a lot of hours on that. And almost all of it is about the, 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 the structure of the federal government and the, na and the history of the nation state. And I would like them to learn the history of the nation state in a way that's a little more intellectually profound, really, that raises deeper questions. It's not a series of, of events. But I don't want to be satisfied with a national depiction. So the love should be for a lot of different things. Yeah, I, no, I agree with that. And I think the love is, is, is in any kind of arrangement of subsidiarity, it's, it has a qualitative difference at each level, you know. I, I don't love my wife the same way I love my country, uh, or, you know, and all sorts of gradations in my town, and, and so on. But, um, yeah, but I think the, 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 the part of the American system, well, let me say something, uh, but you, you mentioned, uh, I think it's a great story. That's not, that's not particularly obvious. Mm -hmm. young people these days, and uh, especially if they've been sort of raised on Howard Zinn or the, the equivalent thereof. I, I'm happy if they read, you know, but, but, uh, but Howard Zinn is, is pretty bad stuff. I mean, uh, you, won't, you won't get many professional historians defending uh, Howard Zinn. Uh, and he's sold three million books. They're in high schools all over the place. I was just giving a talk on my book at, at Scarsdale, a uh, very wealthy suburb of New York City, and all the kids there, oh, yeah, they all had Howard Zinn in their class. One, one, so I haven't even really read it, but one diagnosis of, this, of the um, success of it, the popularity of it, is that it is actually a compelling narrative. Right? It's very well right. written. And so I mean, if, it's, it, the, it, and the it's great, a great comic book. You know? But, it, but the great a, story of America is a, is a great drama, right, uh, which, in which I see the darkness very predominant. So I might not, we might not agree there, but that doesn't matter. The, the point is that the story is a very dramatic story, and I think he might be getting that better than your typical mass I agree with history, that. No, I, and I think the, 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 uh, the big three, you know, Pearson, McGraw-Hill, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, Houghton Mifflin, I guess. Uh, they, they, they're these enormous texts in which everything is thrown in, lots of sidebars, jazzy graphics. And Zen at least has a kind of narrative, and he's got a, a thesis, a hobby horse that he's riding, which is basically, uh, you know, the black hats always win. <laughs> in American history, the right, white, and that's the, there's white hats and white, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can, can I tell a quick story about a jury that connects to this? Sure. 
So I was recently on the um, on a, on a jury. Well, I was called. I was in the jury pool in Middlesex County, Massachusetts, which is a beautiful thing to see. It's a cross section of America, mm -hmm. and we weren't actually selected, but we, we we waited, and then the judge came out, and he said, "Thank you so much for your service, and you've you know it's this is f fabulous, um, you know this this is important to our the, to the to justice to the to the conduct of justice that you're even here, and it's and you would have deliberated well, and he said, and only in America." Is there a jury system? Because this, this is a judge, right, who presumably went to law school. And I thought, what's the, what's the temptation to tell us that we should be proud and love this because only in America are there juries? I mean, does anyone know how many countries have juries systems? It's Not uh, as many as you think. No, but it's, it's third. It's pretty the anglophone world. Well, but this was, yeah, this was a criminal case, and yeah. But I mean, for also, we got our jury system from another particular yeah. country that yeah. of, of some. Right, but what's the, what's the motivation to make us think? So it's. I, well, we were, in, we were being weighted to, on a criminal case that was that where, the, where the defendant decided not to um, go before a jury, I mean, opted not for a jury. So the, the, what would have been salient in his mind was a criminal case. That's what he was in the next room negotiating. So I, I, think, I think he was trying to say, I think he had the premise that in order, so this is my actual theory, that he's, he's got the premise that in order to love the experience, you have to decide that there's something unique about the attachment to this particular policy, that, to, that it would be undermined by finding out that they use it in a different country. And um, also that if you started doing a comparative inquiry into the United States judicial system versus other judicial systems, it'd be very murky and frankly pretty ugly and you'd have a lot of why do we have the highest incarceration rate in the world and so on. So what we want to do is just say we're so happy to be here. This is the, this is the only system in the world which affords jury trial rights. And I just, I found that, um, I, what I thought was that was, was a thin cover for a deep anxiety. And, the, and that the, the, the love for both the country and for the jury system should not be predicated upon that. I mean, even, even if it's true that there are hardly any countries, what if Canada just decides to um, use civil jury trials for civil cases? Are we supposed to then say, well, we're not that proud to be Americans anymore? I mean, it's not, it's not the basis for pride. So, so the, the accurate thing would be to say we're one of the few countries in the world that have a jury system. A yeah. fairly significant number, and, and we didn't invent it. Yeah. And we had it before we, we had some really important jury trials in Massachusetts when we were a colony of another country. Yeah. <laughs> but we ought to still be, and are we, are we saying that it, people in a different country, if they did an, adopt an American-style jury system, shouldn't really be that proud of it because they, because it's basically, they're only number, they're only the 14th country to use it? I mean, it's, the, 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 the commitment has to be to the thing, not to the, not to the unique. To the idea you're saying, not to the, yeah, the substantiation. Yeah. Bill, yeah. do you have a, uh, oh, no, no, I, I, I think he's cleared it up. I, I was thinking, I wonder if maybe, maybe we should raise the, the issue of the 1619 project of the New York Times is something that maybe the audience will want to have a, uh, a whack at, but, um, and, and that might be a way of thinking of uniqueness from a negative <laughs> standpoint, because uh, I'll just give you my, my take on it. Uh, is that I think it was a great missed opportunity of the Times to, uh, uh, to highlight something that I think was worth, well worth highlighting, uh, even though there's even some debate about whether the, the individuals dropped off in Jamestown in 1619 were slaves or indentured servants, but leave that aside. I'm, I'm happy to, you know, the, the characterization of slaves, uh, enslaved peoples. But uh, um, it, it um, to, to then construct, if, if it served as a reminder of the fact that uh, the history of Africans in America goes back even before the Puritans. That it all goes all the way back, uh, and uh, it, it, it's this not just something that's sort of sprinkled in at some point. It's, it goes all the way back, and then and and uh, it, it has been central. That would be very, I think, helpful to public understanding. But what the Times did was when they went further, they 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 had they had to make the argument that uh, everything exceptional about the United States stems from this moment, and that that is the real foundation, not the, uh, not the Revolutionary War, not the, the, the framing of the Constitution, ratification, of, you know, whatever, uh, it, it, uh, all of those superstructural political events that we normally associate with the narrative. 
And that, I think, was going way too far. And it actually <laughs> disabled the 1619 Project as an instrument of civic education. Uh, I think if it had been done more in the way I suggest that it could have been done, then I think it would enhance civic education. But, but to me, and I'd be interested if others have thoughts about this, but to me, the, the, the project was saying, was, it was giving uh, young people, yet yeah, particularly young African Americans, uh, 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 yet another voice telling them that you do not have a, you do not have a place in American life. You, you are cut off from the promise of American life. I thought, I thought it was from the very fatalistic too, but here's a question that I would want students to wrestle with, which is how many foundings have we had and, and what's a founding anyway? Because a founding, a founding is, if you take the metaphor seriously, it's, it's the build, especially a foundation. The building of a foundation is the building of some kind of underlying um, structure on which you can build new things on top, but it's always down there, right? So one view is we had one founding in 1788, 1789. Another view is we had another, we had one founding, which was, 1492, 1619, once we had taken land by force and people didn't part with enslaved people, that set the foundation and it's always there. You can build new things on top of it, but it's always there. Another view is we had three or four foundations post, so we didn't have just 1789, we had also 1865 and even maybe 1932. Another view is we don't have a found, the kind of Dewey view, we don't have a foundation. We're in we're in a, a con we, we, we have a, con there's, there's no base superstructure relationship. I actually think that's a great question. I, I think so too, I, I, but I think it, it, um, it, and it's one that should be considered, but I, I think using the word founding in that way blurs it rather than. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing it. that intentionally yeah. to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. we because agree. <laughs> just, Bill, can you just yeah. explain that using founding You're as if it could have multiple yeah. senses rather than no, no, I think using it in multiple senses rather than using it in a fairly clear and defined sense as we use it when we talk about, you know, the, the results of the Constitutional Convention. Yeah, so I'm, I'm problematizing that as yeah. I say. So I'm yeah. saying that you, that you might debate because it is, after all, a metaphor. So if, um, if there's much more continuity before that and after that, then, then the, the, the term foundation is, is, a, is a, a misleading term. Uh, for example, if the 1619 Project is, is right, then it's, it's not a founding. It's a, it's a, re, it's a, it's a re renovation of the house that was already, where the foundation was already what's, laid. What's true, though, is that, you know, I, I think arguably one of the reasons that the Constitutional Convention couldn't uh, it finally, you know, d deliver on the abolition of slavery at that time was that it was economically too, already too entrenched. Right, right, so right. So that's a kind of foundation. That's right, uh, that's uh, right, that's right. And, and, the, and we, I wanted to uh, mention to all the people who have airplanes to catch uh, going home, in your, in your bags for this conference, you should have our pocket constitution. And we, we have added to the Declaration and the Constitution the Gettysburg Address, which captures many of these points and Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream address from a century after the Gettysburg Address, 1965. is another candidate for a founding. So right. Lin Lin Lincoln's way of capturing these kinds of questions uh, is to say 1776 was the founding of a nation, but it has gone through a great trial, and there is now a need for the living. It is a ch it's a charge to citizens. It is for us, the living to advance the cause for which those who died here uh, died and have nobly advanced. And, and, and it, is to, it is to have a new birth. Yes, it's, it's so it's our fathers, but it's a set of ideas. Yeah. It's to have a new birth of freedom. Uh, so it's interesting, both, both Lincoln and King use birth and then dream, new birth and then dream, but King cites the Declaration and the Constitution. King. King cites 1776 right. as the origin of the American dream. It's the promissory note. You yeah. know, and we've come here to Washington to cash the check. Oh, so you're saying he's Lockean as well. Well, no, so I, 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 I don't know. I, would. <laughs> I have to see if yeah. Michael Zucker would approve of yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you make of that? That Lincoln, Lincoln does say there's a, Lincoln and King say there is a, there is a founding that does well, have to just, be made more perfect. Or Peter may be already about to say this, but that, that, that's one of the debates. Uh, I heard you say something about 1863 as a, uh, the date. I mean, you know, Gary Wills and before him, Wilmer Kendall made that argument that Lincoln, in fact, refounded 
the nation on the Declaration, the notion that the Constitution had to be understood, which is, he'd, he'd been arguing this already, the Constitution had to be understood in light of the Declaration, um, and that that was, in effect, uh, a, a rethinking of the whole basis of the national enterprise, even without inventing anything new, but just collocating the documents in a different way. Which uh, is a creative task. Well, I think that would be my basic which, thought. So and and I think that's stuck. <laughs> frankly. Well, I mean, maybe, but then gets re, re, yeah. recreated and there's opportunities to recreate it. So I think, I think the uh, history is a set of legacies that are, of which you can make things, a variety of things. It's not just true of the Republic, but it's also true, for example, of a re any given religion, that it's a whole mass of stuff and you, you make things out of it. And so the, the move of saying, actually, this was when we were founded, but that was a promissory note, it's a creative move. And it's one of the things that I think you want to learn to do as a citizen. So, so it's, I'm, I'm not sure there's a truth to the question of whether the United States was founded in 1619 or 1776. There's a normative agenda behind making each of those claims, and then you can make it real by the way you use yeah, it. It's yeah, a, yeah. Although I, 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 I think there's a real danger in introducing in this kind of discourse the notion that of, of myths, of self-consciously identifying some of these really foundational uh, assertions, such as those in the Declaration of Independence, as having a mythic quality. I think that's, that's well, you were, dangerous. Yeah, you, were, you were interested in actually um, asserting the truth of natural rights earlier. That yes, would be, I, that would be I, a I philosophical am interested discussion in that. that we, might, we might, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if we, people want to go into that. Yeah. So I do yeah. uh, one last question before, we, then we'll bring out the microphone and, and have questions from the audience. So th there, there is in the community of educators, university and schools and civic groups beyond, uh, a, a difference of opinion about this um, set of philosophical questions, roughly crudely put left right, but also this set of questions about whether students and citizens should learn to think first in terms of action and doing, or first in terms of a, a history of a people, and let's put it in Lincoln's terms, right, uh, uh, on the basis of certain truths about human beings, and which, which you emphasize. Is it, so my final question for you, can this community of educators think of themselves as civic friends, American civic friends, able to recognize disagreements? We've had various speakers make versions of this argument. R Roger Smith did it yesterday in remarks about two different conceptions of the Constitution let's say, an originalist view of the Constitution, the more progressive version. Can we still be American civic friends and, and uh, recognize those important differences but come together as educators to say, boy, we have work to do? Or I should say boy, girl, and various other identities. We, boy, we have work to do uh, and, and we should come together on the consensus points that we have. Is it possible or am I, dream am I dreaming too, a little bit too dreamily that right now, at a very polarized time, in education and beyond education, we could get some consensus and uh, agree on what we can agree upon and make, make room to hear the disagreements in curricula for, for school students and for university students and civic education and beyond. So two quick points, and then I hope we'll say. So two optimistic points. Um, one is, um, we actually probably disagree a lot on uh, public policy. I mean, we don't know each other that well, but I'm, you know, I'm a left liberal. I, so my view of what the state should do is different, probably different from, from yours. It didn't matter at all for the discourse about how you should teach civics. It wouldn't have been necessarily evident to anybody. It, and it doesn't actually matter because the framework that we're creating is one in which people are supposed to decide for themselves as self-governing people um, what, they, what the government should do. And um, you said that uh, skepticism about government is part of um, the civic education, and as somebody who would vote for more government than you would, I totally agree. Um, and you worried about an administrative state, and I worry about it too. Uh, not because of its size, but because of the way that it, it competes with civic values. So I think you can have that. The other thing is, there is some debate about whether civic education should be strictly or heavily experiential in, in the school. That is about whether you have to learn democracy by doing democracy. And I, I, so I would just say there, I'm, I'm really um, empirical and pragmatic. I mean, it depends on whether it works or not. Um, I, I, you know, Martin Luther King didn't get a, that kind of education, but he got a really good education uh, in more, you know, in, in, at home and in more, at Morehouse. And it, so to me, it's, it's simply a question of what works. I think, I think the 
um, evidence is a bit mixed, and I, I wouldn't go so far as to say you main that what we what, what we believe based on research is that first you should teach history and later she practice stuff. I suspect little kids can actually practice a lot of this in important ways, and that's important, but it, to me it's empirical, so I bow to the evidence. Yeah, we might have a little dis I, 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 the what works thing makes me nervous because there, there is a kind of, um, and it's not only on the left, there's a lot of people on, all, everywhere, but sort of our goals oriented, results oriented, ends oriented, uh, and you know, part of uh, democracy is all about proceduralism. It's all about means. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that we are so stuck on, in this country on the issue of abortion is the way, we, way that change happened. Uh, it, what didn't happen in a way that, that really arrived at a sense of what would be a legitimate ground and to, to which 50% plus one <laughs> could agree to. Uh, and, but it was imposed uh, as, a, as a Supreme Court diktat, and not even a particularly honest one or straightforward one. Uh, it's, it's just a, a, a guidebook of how not to do things, irrespective of what you think about the, the goal. So I, I think doing things in the right, you know, one of the great things about uh, King and the march is the civil rights bill that came out of it, which was supported by both parties. This was not something where all the Democrats voted, <laughs> many Democrats voted against it. Uh, it, was a, it was bipartisan, it, was, it received overwhelming majorities. It did have to be sustained by challenges in the Supreme Court, which is, it was able to sustain itself it, with. But it worked its way through the process in a way to be unassailable. Um, uh, and. Uh, that's the way to do things, I think, in our system. I, I'm, I'm, I think too many young people, um, I'm surprised you're agreeing with me, but th I think too many young people have the notion that the way to get change is through social action. We just had an incident at my university uh, where uh, a, a group of stu a grieved students made a sit-in at the provost's office and demanded he be fired, even though he had nothing to do with the thing they were aggrieved about. And, uh, um, you know, that's, it, they, things have settled down, cooler heads have prevailed, but you know, that this is a reflex that social action outside of the structure of our institutions is, uh, is really the way you get things done, the way you make that's, change. That's another great um, debating point which should be central to the question of civic education. So change top down, bottom up, change inside, change outside, that's, that's a good question. I would, I would want to be neutral about that as an educator. Great. So now uh, we will have a microphone. Um, we'll keep with the, the custom of our school to have a uh, first opportunity for some students. Um, and if we could keep questions brief as questions rather than uh, filibusters and brief-ish answers from our guests. So uh, I've got two questions, one's really quick and for Dean Levine. Uh, did Dr. Kreese always know how to sing like uh, Frank Sinatra? I do not remember, but okay. it seems likely and he was always a good guy. Okay, <laughs> I, I know he's a good guy, just want to know if he has yeah. any other impersonations. And I also there. encourage this behavior. I me, think it's, me too, uh, yeah. 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 Um, but so then did getting more into us a, to sing though. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Uh, no, because I want to ask you guys questions. Um, so this is more of a serious question, obviously. Um, I feel as if we have a collective action problem where we have partisan state governments that are altering civic education in order to meet their, um, their, their end goals that you guys kind of referred to a little bit earlier. We have Southerners that distribute textbooks that refer to the Civil War as the War of Northern Aggression so that they just totally ignored Lincoln singing Baby Come Back at his first inauguration. Um, but we also have northern states that will ban books like To Kill a Mockingbird, which you can argue um, instill a certain civic education in kids by showing them how people like Atticus Finch can be exemplary citizens. Um, how do we solve this collective action problem if we're going to instill a love of country for, for our youth, if we're going to um, give them a civic education that shows them how to be good citizens and to really always be asking the question of uh, what can we do? Great. Can I, can I say a couple of things about it? So I, it's a great question. I actually am not as worried as you are, and I'll tell you why. So the New York Times did a really helpful uh, story a couple of months ago where they took 
the McGraw-Hill textbook is, is actually implemented in Texas, you may have seen this, in Texas and in California. So it's laid out the same, it's the same design, and most of the words are the same, but there are these changes. And it's interesting, because, they, because of those are state adoption states where the, where the board buys the, the textbook for the whole state, and so they changed. And the, the basic line of the very well reported and reasonably useful article was this is a sort of a scandal because look at what happens. We should have, why, can't, why do we have this politicized curriculum? So I actually see the glasses largely full rather than part empty. First of all, it's a, it's a federal republic. So I think you, it's built to have diversity. So I don't think you would expect, and I don't know if you really want to see the textbooks in California and Texas be the same. They are about 98% the same. And then the other thing is they've, if you look past the highlights where they've pulled out what's different, those textbooks have changed tremendously since I was, in both states, since I was taught. You know, so I was pretty, as best I can remember, I was pretty much taught in a north, way up north, near, nearly in Canada, that um, Reconstruction was a corrupt, uh, you know, uh, imposition by, by northern uh, people. On this. And both in Texas and California, you learn that Reconstruction was a failed effort at, at freedom and equality. And so that's a change, and, and the way that enslaved people's stories are told and stuff. So I sort of see these two textbooks as reasonably, well, there were a couple of things in it that made me mad about particular lines that were put in and put out, but it's a hurly-burly of democracy. You're gonna see things you don't love in any, t in any document. But it is improving. What's that? So I think it's improving, and I think the diversity is a sign that um, we live in a federal republic. It's not a sign. So some people said, well, it shows that textbooks are politicized. Of course they're politicized. They're government documents brought into schools. It's po political. I think if the two states with that diametrically opposed adoption committees end up with basically the same text, I'm fine. Thank you. I hope I didn't preempt No, you. no, no. That, 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 no. Uh, thank you all for speaking. Um, so my question was already somewhat addressed, uh, um, but it was about uh, the relationship between particular circumstances and general truths, and which one comes first. Um, so for those who are in academia, in uh, any sort of political philosophy, uh, you know, you, you engage in the pursuit of general truths, but at the same time, uh, you engage in some sort of particular circumstantial knowledge, and this seems to be somewhat of an accidental relationship where you could start with, with one or go to the other and it doesn't really matter. Um, so my question more is about, uh, well, even if those people who learn general truths uh, by some of their own individual pursuit can look into particular circumstances, what do you do with the people that uh, can only understand particular circumstances and have never been educated in uh, these general principles or truths, especially American general principles, is it? Yeah. Is that is that right? Is that a fair inference? Yeah. I don't know what. Yeah, <laughs> it's hard to know what the, the people who are not incapable of of making abstractions, abstract ge generalizing from particular experiences. They know only their own particular experience, and that's what you're getting. How can you get people to think beyond themselves? I'm just trying to draw out what you're asking. You, you ask in such a philosophical way that, because uh, I was thinking this guy's a, a philosophy major. He's not a historian. So, you know, historians are always uh, interested in particulars and loathe to generalize. Uh, uh, so I, that's the world I. Come but Nikhil, from. in part, do what you, you what you're saying is if a, a student has not had an education. Is that what you mean in part? They haven't had an education which exposed them to the Declaration of Independence or Lincoln or Douglas, Frederick Douglass about the Declaration, or Martin Luther King, H how, how to help them to understand there are general principles about America? Or right, if, that, if yeah. they haven't uh, had an education in those, but then in their own private lives, they've you know, seen a particular uh, circumstance where something has happened in their uh, you know, society. Can, can you, know you just get, give a concrete example of what you're talking about? Because I think that would help me get a handle on it. Now, like just a particular set of circumstances, a particular person. So, you know, that might really help me get, get a handle on what you're saying. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, if someone is not, so if someone, uh, you know, even spends their degree uh, maybe doing uh, engineering, right? Uh, or maybe some practical art or, you know, and then they go into their society, and uh, of course, by any means nowadays, you can see these uh, 
anything happen with you know news or whatever you see something going on in your society and you still feel a certain way about uh, what you want to do uh, about this whether you think it's good or bad or uh, whatever but uh, how then are they without having a prior education of general truths like you know political philosophy major would have this accidental relationship how are they supposed to make this connection then and understand the importance of their circumstance and, and Peter, Peter did say earlier, you're, in your view, right, civic education is a lifelong activity. Right, you, right. You, you, obviously, there's a role for schools, but all citizens need to continue to be thinking about and learning about um, America, the meaning of America. And, and, there, and there's, a, there's a lifelong uh, interplay between particular and general, abstract and concrete, and it's hard. Because one problem that we have as human beings is we don't generalize enough or we don't see the big picture. But the other problem is that we apply generalities too quickly, which is ideology in its worst form. So, um, you know, I think I, my PhD is in philosophy. I think philosophy is valuable, but I think philosophy by itself has a tendency to be too abstract and um, in, a, in a really problematic way, especially in the political domain. So you want to you do both and you want to learn it. You want to keep learning it because you can't learn it all at once. I, I think part of what you're getting at is, um, and maybe I'm riding my own hobby horse here <laughs> with your question, but. Uh, uh, is the, the weakness of the tendency towards vocationalism in higher education, which is, is very strong. Uh, I think it may be a little strong at this university, if I may say. Uh, and uh, that, that uh, you know, the, 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 those eight principles that uh, Elizabeth Corey read. Um, and uh, uh, that, that liberal education is, is, uh, is, is extraordinarily important and valuable for good citizenship. If you all you you can be have have uh, the knowledge of petroleum engineering or metallurgy or whatever, uh, you know, like nobody's business, but that doesn't tell you anything about how to understand other people's circumstances. And uh, uh, that's I think part of your question. The answer to your question is that we really do need liberal education. Liberal education is a liberal in the sense that it frees us from the prison of our own upbringing, our own world, not necessarily to refute it, uh, not necessarily make us say, uh, you know, <laughs> fly upon our parents and all of that, but to, to, to give us a larger perspective on all of that, a larger, more inclusive, humanity-embracing perspective. Uh, so uh, that's how I would answer you. We need liberal education. Here, here. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, to both of you guys for being here. You kind of already began to touch upon my question. Uh, I'm sure that everybody in this room has heard the Frederick Douglass quote, knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. Uh, if this is true, does the lack of knowledge make a man fit to be a slave? And I think this quote is very relevant to America right now, especially with America being grounded in the ideals of liberty and equality. So what are your thoughts on education in relation to freedom? Well, I don't think anybody in, in this country thinks or should think that anybody is fit to be a slave. Right. So that, 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 that's, that's that was a neat part. formulation, but I'm not gonna let you get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the formulation is not right because of an idea. Yes, right? a, and, a and, 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 and I knowledge, think uh, you would not accept slavery for anybody. Knowledge, you know, the tools of knowledge, the ability to read, the ability to do research, and I just mean on a very rudimentary level, research, not you know, research libraries or anything like that, but the, the ability to look things up, the ability to, to, to uh, not be constrained by, again, to echo what I just said, uh, by what, uh, what, what you learn, by the knowledge of the tribe, whatever that tribe happens to be, or even your own family. Uh, I mean, a liberal society um, you know, believes that that's part of the preparing a person to be a free individual. Is uh, uh, now where I think there's something to your formulation is that that this doesn't just happen. Freedom is uh, the, the freedom in the sense, and, and and Douglas certainly, I could we could find other quotations which he'd say this exactly. But uh, freedom is is liberty is something you have to work at to achieve. Uh, it doesn't, it isn't just the sort of natural condition. Uh, so uh, education can be a part of that uh, if we do it in the right way. 
Yeah, I would only add that education doesn't education is liberating, but education doesn't automatically liberate. So if the jackboot of the state is on the back of your neck, it may not help for you to know more. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it's, a, it's a good idea to know more, and it sometimes liberates, but it doesn't come automatically. That's, that, the reason to say that is because otherwise it always becomes the responsibility of the person who's held down to, well, educate yourself, and sometimes that's not possible. And one of the value of having dissidents in a society is that you know as long as dissidents are allowed to exist, even if what they're saying is rubbish, which it often is not, but the very existence of such, such people means that the, the jackboot of the state is not on your neck. Or, uh, or it's not necessarily it's on your It's neck. less likely to be. Yeah. Howard right. Zinn has the freedom to write and, and uh, be a Become very a successful zillion, author. A and zillionaire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. That's a good question. Really. Yeah. I think this will be our final question. No pressure. You know. <laughs> well, I want to thank you guys for being here, and also Dr. Carol McNamara as well for organizing the event. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't think that Dr. Levine is stupid, like he said in the beginning. And I, more importantly, I don't think that Alexis de Tocqueville would have agreed with you in regards to your stupidity. Um, I think that there might be some danger in what you said, uh, this notion that Tocqueville addresses that um, a group of men or a group of people is always going to be more intelligent than the individual. And so this idea um, hinders the individual from confiding, confiding in themselves. And um, now I, while I realize the, the, the importance of the we and this need for a balance, um, as someone who's civically engaged um, and taught you know, to look out for this sort of thing, how can, how can we protect against the dangers of this issue of democracy? Yes, no, that's right. The flattery notwithstanding, that was a, that was a very important point. Um, I mean, that is, I, I am stupid, but that's a different story. <laughs> but the, the, the point is that there's a, there is a, Tocqueville, of course, was a great uh, prophet of conformity as a threat to liberty. And so being in the we all the time is a risk to liberty and to, and to wisdom because of groupthink and because of, uh, yeah, conformity broadly defined. And so the I is also important. And, and one of the things you can do when you're a group is you, you can exit. And if you don't exit, you're complicit. And so I think one of the basic ethical questions is, am I in or am I out? And what, what point do I need to be out? I do think, I'll say one more thing though, I think that groups do have value for the reasons I said, including the intellectual value of challenging you because, they're, because the other people in the group are different from you. And therefore a group can have, uh, so, so one thing you do in civic life is you go along with a group that you don't, where you don't quite agree. And some people are quick to, to leave, and I think they're, they're, they're making a mistake. Um, uh, W.D. Du Bois says, organization is discipline, period. And, what, and that's in the context of saying that he's in a position where he has to disagree with his own organization, the NAACP, but he knows that organization is discipline. And so um, I think you give, you walk out, you, you, um, if you're a good, good citizen, you retain the ability to walk out, you retain the I, you're, um, you are an I ultimately, and you can leave, but you don't leave too quickly because that, that, that we that you were in was a mechanism both for, um, for reasoning together and also for doing something done. And once you walk out, you're just by yourself. Bill, do you have a? No, oh, that was no, very no. well said. Yeah, that, okay. was, that was great. <laughs> I, I disagree profoundly, but I <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Just for the record, yeah, you reserve yeah, your right yeah, to right, disagree. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, all good things must come to an end. Um, I do have a few uh, closing words of uh, thanks, and then, and then one logistical point, especially for, for travelers, out-of-town travelers. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, we have two different advisory boards for the school, an academic advisory board, and so we're grateful that uh, Catherine Zucker um, was able to be with us, a member of the uh, adv academic advisory board. And across the two days of the conference, we had four members of the advisory board uh, of civic and political leaders that we call our board of counselors. Uh, and, and I think and Ron is still here, Ron Christie. Uh, Mayor Anna Tovar of, of Tolleson, Arizona, was with us for most of both days. Uh, we had Senator Kyle, Senator John Kyle with us yesterday, and then Rich Lowry, one of our keynote speakers. Um, so we're grateful that members of both of those boards could be with us. We are very grateful to this extraordinary range of speakers who shared their time with us, um, uh, traveling quite far uh, away, some with greater difficulties of travel than, the, uh, than others for this great feast of uh, viewpoints and conversations across 
two days. Uh, as one of our students just mentioned, we, we are, are extraordinarily grateful to the, the staff, uh, faculty and staff of this school uh, that has worked very hard to organize this um, conference, uh, the Civic Discourse Project series of which it's a part. Uh, Dr. Carol McNamara is our Associate Director for Public Programs, began conceiving this conference more than a year ago. Uh, but joining her, uh, Adam Seagrave, the Associate Director for the school as a whole, uh, Matt uh, Senesuso, the Assistant Director for the school, and then I'll mention just sort of the managers of different parts of, of the staff. Um, Catherine uh, Sheffield, our events manager, Joe Martin, our communications manager, various other staff have been here, uh, student workers. We say thank you to Arizona PBS, the team that's been here uh, for two days uh, organizing with us. So please, if you would say thank you to all these folks who organized it. And since, since as Americans we believe both in universal ideas but we are particular, I do have a final logistical note I've been asked to make about Uber or other rideshare services or taxi cabs. So if, for those of you who are heading to the airport, um, if you exit this building in the southeast corner, which you'll just have to trust me is that a way, uh, and you head roughly south into the business school, you eventually find an extraordinary statue of horses and uh, with a little circle there, a traffic circle, and that, that's the, the ride share location that, or, or perhaps a taxi cab to be fair to all parts of the economy um, where, where you might be finding a ride. Thank you all of you, uh, many of you I can see in the audience have been here for both days. Uh, so thank you for joining us and uh, whether you're traveling near or far, uh, hope you travel safely and especially for those of you who are near do spread the word about our public events, which are free and open to everybody, ASU students, faculty, staff, uh, community members. We have two more events in the Civic Discourse series uh, coming this spring. Um, just a few weeks from now, we'll have former Secretary of the Air Force, former member of Congress, Heather Wilson, uh, speaking uh, in honor of, of uh, Women's um, History Month in, in March, but talking about uh, civic leadership, especially from a woman's perspective. And then uh, later in the semester, we will have a distinguished economist, political economist, Tyler Cohen, talking uh, from his point of view about issues of leadership. So thank you for being with us. Safe travels. Thanks, him. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.